Welcome everybody to this week's edition of Holotube and we are very happy to have Johanna Erdminger with us today. I'm especially happy because Johanna was my PhD supervisor so today is a very special um, Holotube for me and so I'm very happy to greet you and um, have you talk about discrete holography. The screen is yours Johanna. Yeah, thank you very much, Matthias. Thanks for inviting me. And, uh, you know, I'm very happy about Holotube because quite a few people who organize this, they, they work with me at some point, so Matthias and also Martin, they were my students. And uh, Daniel, uh, he was a postdoc in Munich at some point. So I'm, of course, uh, very attached to Holotube. And uh, I'm very happy that you invited me to give a talk. So as you all know, I'm in Würzburg now. And um, so you can see this beautiful castle, which is on the other side of the river mine here in this picture. So this is my background uh, for the talk. And I, I should acknowledge funding through this um, grant, German grant from the German Federal Ministry of uh, Science and also uh, the lender in Germany, uh, which actually provides money for collaboration between in our case, CTQMAT is Würzburg and Dresden, and there's collaboration between condensed matter physicists of different sorts. And I'm very happy that ADSCFT also contributes there. And uh, so that uh, certainly motivated a lot of joint work with condensed matter physicists. Okay, so what the talk today is about discrete holography. So, okay, so now, uh, yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, so let me explain, give, give you, let me start by giving some motivation what we want to do. Okay, so the goal is to establish um, a holographic duality for hyperbolic tilings. So here you can see a, a hyperbolic tiling uh, with heptagons. So this is a Euclidean ADS2. And uh, um, you can see that you, you can fill this with these heptagons of which three of each uh, meet at each corner. And it, um, because the space is non-compact, you need an infinite number of these heptagons until you reach the boundary. And um, so uh, we want to establish a duality for this in the spirit of the um, ADS-CFT correspondence. And uh, so what exactly do I mean by duality? Um, I, I like to show this plot, which I think partially was motivated by, by Martin Amon when we were working on the book on monography. He proposed such a diagram. Unfortunately, he's not around right now, but uh, let me mention him. And um, so the, um, the duality in, in the sense that I'm going to use for this talk is that you have some physical system, which of course in the original ADS-CFT correspondence are your D3 brains. And then you have one theory um, given by an action or a Hamiltonian, depending on whether you're a particle or a condensed matter physicist. And then another theory uh, written in the terms of a different action or Hamiltonian with different degrees of freedom. But if these two theories describe the same physical system, then they of course must be related in some way. And this relation then is called a duality. So that's my definition of duality for this talk. And uh, of course, um, if you asked me say 10 or 15 years ago, I would have always said that um, holography is a direct consequence of string theory and you really need uh, string theory to understand this duality but uh, partially due to the Rio Takayanagi formula and all the subsequent beautiful developments I, I changed my mind on this and um, I'm pretty sure that this holographic principle plays a role um, far beyond string theory but then of course if it, it if it holds beyond string theory we should find examples for holographic dualities um, outside or beyond string theory. And so that's the plan here. And um, um, we didn't quite succeed yet, but we made some interesting steps, which I'm going to show to you. And um, also show some plans to how to complete this uh, story in hopefully not too distant future. Okay, so I should mention some papers um, that we wrote here in Würzburg, mostly um, on the subject. Uh, and then they, they will be mentioned during the talk. We just introduced the people. So Pablo Bastero is one of my PhD student. Um, Felix Usel was a master student of Haye Hendrickson, sorry, who, who is my colleague here um, at the chair for theoretical physics three, and of course Lenny Meyer. And um, then um my head was another master student, and Manuel Schaud is an excellent numerical person. And um, uh, Giuseppe Di Giulio is also very important here in, in this work for establishing um, the, the Hamiltonians at the boundary of the duality. And Joe Eugene, um, our postdoc, is an expert in 
uh, tensor networks, which were also very relevant. And Jonathan Kahn is my master student here. And Ratinra Das is another PhD student. So you can see quite a lot of people here in Würzburg, they got in, involved in this program now. Okay, so uh, as a further point of motivation, let me say that this topic has connected interesting, very interesting connections to lots of neighboring research areas. And uh, towards the end of the talk, I, I would like to go through them and, and explain to you these beautiful relations. And so, uh, so I, I will show to you there's some very interesting connections to, to, to mathematics and also mathematical physics. And there's some actual theorems which have been proven by mathematicians that I would like to refer to briefly uh, that are very interesting in this context. And then, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, when I was talking about this excellence cluster CTQMAT, um, there's some very close relations to condensed matter physics and even electric circuits. I also going to refer to that. And then, uh, so um, some of my colleagues here in Würzburg, like Oni Tomalo, they, they're working on these things. And I will mention this as well. Then, um, if you have a lattice, you can think of doing quantum gravity beyond uh, the one over n, um, beyond the large n expansion. Sorry, and um, so that that's a possibility more for the future. But I, I mentioned that briefly as well. And, and I should say that there is also lattice gauge theorists uh, who study now these hyperbolic lattices and also have interesting results there. So, so then you can see that from very different aspects of physics, people are interested in this topic. Okay, I will come back to this towards the end. Okay, so and that covers my motivation part. And so now I'll enter into the details. And so first I'm going to explain a little bit about hyperbolic tilings. And then the first thing we looked at was the so-called Brighton on Friedman, which should be very familiar to every, any holographer. Uh, I, and I, um, this was our kind of first example where we looked at uh, hyperbolic tilings and how to realize these ADS content and then. Um, then the bulk of the talk will be about this uh, boundary chain, spin chain Hamiltonian that we constructed and which reflects the bulk tiling, uh, which we then studied uh, using RG techniques, tensor networks, and where we also calculated the entanglement entropy. So that, that's the bulk technical part of the talk and, and we spent some time on it. And as I mentioned towards the end, I, I uh, discussed these connections to mathematics, condensed matter theory, and quantum gravity, and a little bit also lattice gauge theory, and, and with an outlook to what remains to be done. Okay, um, so uh, that's the starting point now for um, the more formal part. So um, and let me describe a little more these features of regular hyperbolic tilings uh, of the Poincaré disk. Okay, I should say right away, if you would like to ask questions during the talk, please um, feel free to do so. I think that will make things more lively and uh, please go ahead and interrupt me at any time. Okay, so um, we consider an ADS 2 plus 1 space and fix a constant time slice. Um, which then gives us this metric. So we have a disk here inside this ADS two plus one. Time is this direction which goes uh, along the cylinder. And um, so um, if we just restrict our attention to a constant time slice, um, then we can de define a, a geodesic, well, we can define this geodesic distance in general, but if we consider the case that the time is the same, we can use these coordinates rho and phi and uh, write our geodesic distance in this way. Um, now, if we consider tiling, so here there's uh, a pentagon or a heptagon or a hexagon, um, then um, actually, if we want an ADS space, of course, we need a negative curvature. And um, this negative curvature we achieve uh, if this uh, inequality holds. So P is the number of corners in each um, polygon. So in this case, this would be seven, um, whereas Q is the number of polygons that meet at each vertex. For instance, here, there, this is three. So that's a seven, three hyperbolic lattice. That's five, four, and that's six, four. Okay, and then there's different ways of drawing these projections, either in terms of regular polygons or here just following the geodesics, but I mean, they're, they're equivalent to each other. Now there's uh, lots of important quantities that you can define. So assuming we take pentagons, um, then um, from the hyperbolic trigonometry and, and this um, geodesic distance, uh, we can 
these define the, the, the length of the polygon and these uh, quantities inside, and there's various angles which reflect these numbers P and Q. Okay, so that's so, so P and Q are the numbers to remember, uh, which they, they will appear a lot during the talk, and they, they define this, um, this particular structure. Okay, so the first thing we looked at uh, was the bright lunar Friedman bond, and I'm sure you're all super familiar with what this is. And so this is a result of bright and Friedman from 1985, so um, even before ideas CFT. And they were studying supergravity on um, uh, anti lissiter spaces. Now, if we apply this to this ADS2 space, um, then uh, the white and Friedman bond says that we have stability if m squared times l squared for scalar fields is bigger than minus a quarter. So with l being the ADS radius. Okay. So this minus one quarter is the, the white and Friedman bond for um, ADS2. Okay. So um, then what we did in this first paper first in this paper is to reconsider uh, the continuum case which of course is super familiar and so we start uh, with the euclidean um, ads2 action for a scalar field which you see here and then um, we use a particular coordinate system involving theta and phi where theta is now the radial direction and um so then um the actual content of the bright and written bound is that um, if this bound is violated, actually the energy um, is not a well-defined quantity anymore. And actually you can show that if the bound is violated, then uh, the scaling dimension here becomes imaginary. And um, then this um, expression here um, is not well-defined anymore. And um, um, so, so, so that's a result already at, um, in the continuum level, of course. So then, of course, we proceeded to discretizing, and I will talk about this in a minute. But before I go to the discretized case, let me first consider the case uh, where you consider continuum ADS2, but you, you choose a, a, a large finite cutoff, uh, which here is called epsilon. Okay, so epsilon. Uh, so in, in these coordinates, uh, when theta is pi half, it means that we are at the boundary. And uh, so epsilon is a small uh, quantity, still small but still microscopic, which tells you how far away you are from the boundary. And um, so essentially, uh, if you are in the continuum ADS space, you can analytically solve the Klein Gordon equation even with a large value of this epsilon. So normally what's done in ads -CFT, that we add uh, counter terms and then want to take epsilon to zero and there's photographic renormalization and so on. But just that for the sake here of implementing then this, these numerical techniques for discrete spaces, let's just assume the case that um, epsilon is uh, some large quantity. And then in that case, you, you can still uh, analytically solve the Klein Gordon equation for the scalar field, and the result is this dashed line here. Um, so in this picture, this dash, this dotted line is the standard uh, bound in the case when epsilon goes to zero, so it's minus a quarter. And um, in in the continuum now um, there are these so-called umklapp points, which I will explain in a minute based on this graph. Um, you see that um, the the analytical result um, for for the continuum case lies on this line, and of course, when epsilon goes to zero, it will asymptote to the the well known uh, value of minus a quarter. Now, uh, so then we implemented some numerical approach, um, and that gives you all these um, uh, colorful dots and squares and crosses. And these are, correspond to different tessellations. Okay, so there's a 73 in the nomenclature that I gave on the previous transparency, 37, 54, 45, 64, 46, and 83. And um, what is interesting, and we don't really have a mathematical proof for that, is that they all uh, asymptote in the same way. So there's a universality in the sense that they all lie on the same curve. Okay, that's an observation of the numerical calculation. In this inset, we you know, did the same calculation um, actually in an electric circuit, I mean, in a theoretical electric circuit um, that where we just used Kirchhoff's rules and I will talk about this in the next slide. But also in that case, we find um, uh, that all these uh, cases follow the same universal curve. 
Okay, let me just quickly say how we implemented the boundary conditions, um, both in the continuum and in the discretized case. So um, I guess you're all familiar with the standard way of um, putting in boundary conditions for, for fields in ADS-CFT, which means that there's a normalizable and a non-normalizable mode. Um, so now, of course, for numerical analysis, that's very hard to implement. And so what we did instead was um, to um, impose a Dirichlet boundary condition um, at this cutoff epsilon. Okay, for the entire solution, including the prefix which makes it normalizable or non normalizable. And uh, on the other hand, for uh, regularity in the interior, we impose a von Neumann boundary condition in the interior. And then here, what we do is to plot the value of the field in the interior um, um, for different values of um, and the cutoff. And so now, um, in the continuum case, um, obviously the entire region um, below um, minus a quarter should be unstable. But in the discrete case, uh, we see these isolated instabilities. And they're, well, sorry, they're, they are at some space from each other. And they, they arise uh, every time when um, actually um, a node of the, um, the solution of the equation of motion of the of the Klein Gordon equation goes through the, this, this finite cutoff that we have. And that, that leads uh, to these singularities. And then you see that if we uh, decrease the value of the cutoff, uh, these singularities, uh, they start moving closer to, to the bound. And also, uh, you know, it fills up. So, and in, in, of course, in the limit, when epsilon goes to zero, the entire region will become unstable here. Okay, so that's shown in this, this plot. And um, uh, so, so this is still for the numerical case, but for the um, discrete case where we discretize uh, the Klein-Gordon equation and, and the mass um, gets, so there's a factor here which reflects uh, the, the hyperbolicity of the lattice. Um, so solving this and th that leads to these dotted points which you see here. Okay, so and, and, and one trivial result is that they all fo follow the this, this same curve. So there's a universality there. Now coming back to this inset. Um, so the point is now you can actually also calculate um, this bound by mapping your gravity system to an electric circuit in the sense that you take a rigid background lattice with these um, polygons. And then um, you design a lattice where there's particular coils and uh, capacitors. So you have inductances and um, capacitors. And um, then uh, following just Kirchhoff's rules, um, you get two equations like this and which you can solve. And then um, you can assume that you impose an uh, alternating uh, voltage of this form. So here comes one of the um, caveats or complications, which is that here we put in some time just to, to get, get the plane wave here. But of course, this is not the time which you have in your ADS2 plus one space. So it's, there's no um, Minkowski space. It's just some auxiliary external time, okay, which is independent of this time evolution that you have in your anti visitor space. Um, so, um, the, so in some, some sense, we have two different concepts of time. We have the one which enters this plane, plane wave, and then another one would be the time that uh, is realized in your ADS2 plus one. But let's talk about, I mean, for, for now, I don't talk about that. Okay, but if you take this Anders and plug it into your Kirchhoff's equations, and then um, you essentially uh, get a Klein Gordon equation. And uh, the, the key point is that then the mass. Um, of your scalar is mimicked by the frequency that you put in by hand here. And um, so as a kind of parameter for your alternating voltage, and then there's the um, inductance and the capacitor and this weight uh, factor, which realizes the hyperbolic lattice. Okay, so then um, you, you, you could in principle construct um, a, a lattice made out of um, uh, capacitors and inductances to to model an anti visitor space. And I should say so, um, our colleagues here in Würzburg um, in Connets Matter Group, Emil Tomalo and his collaborators, um, they actually consider such, such spaces. And I will refer back to them later in the talk. Now, um, 
the, the thing uh, is now that if we sit precisely on one of these singularities that I was discussing before, so one of these points, um, then actually we have a resonant behavior. So if you, this is now an iteration step in your numerical calculation, which um, essentially corresponds to this external time that you put in. So then you drive uh, by this blue curve and then uh, you see here there's a resonant behavior. Now, if you sit outside these um, divergent points and uh, you know, uh, some place where it's still regular, even below the bound, then um, if you drive the system, uh, the response still uh, will die out after, after a while. And uh, so that's um, a signal of this, um, of this instability in, in this case. Okay, so that, that was our first example. And uh, so as you can see, there's really this idea that we can make connection to this work performed by condensed matter physicists and electrical engineers here. Okay, but now let me move on to uh, something slightly more theoretical. And um, so now the idea is that coming back to my motivation from the first slide, I said we would like to have a duality between the theory and the bulk. And, and a theory of at the boundary. <clears throat> now, um, of course, the idea is, I mean, how can we construct any useful um, duality or what, what would be a, a useful theory to consider here at the boundary? So that's the, the question we ask ourselves first, and we have some interesting developments there, but as you will see, it's about half, not even quite half of the story of having a duality, but nevertheless, some very interesting results that I want to show to you. Okay, so the first thing is, and um, we noticed that we can construct um, these hyperbolic tilings uh, through the so-called inflation rules. So this is uh, some idea that was also already used in, in, in this paper. And um, so we can actually successively construct uh, the entire um, discrete space by starting from a central polygon, okay, which in this case um, is this uh, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and hexagon, sorry. <laughs> okay, so we have this hexagon, and um, now uh, what we do is to build consecutive se uh, sequences of se hexagons in, in uh, su su subsequent layers. And um, so now if you do that, then it turns out that there's actually two different kinds of vertices that appear. And these are denoted in blue and red. Now, um, so the different meaning of the blue and the red vertices is that uh, if you consider say this first layer, for instance, um, so the, the blue vertices, they, they have three neighbors in this. If you consider the same and more interior layers, okay, so they have, one neighbor there, one neighbor there, and one neighbor there. So they have three internal neighbors. Whereas if you look at one of the red vertices on the same layer, they just have two neighbors, this one and this one for this particular vertex, for instance, okay? Um, so this means you have two different types of uh, vertices, the ones with two internal neighbors and the ones with three internal neighbors, and we call them A and B or red and blue, okay? And so here, this is just a, the same, but just with a different tiling. This is for the six four, and this is for the four five. And so now, um, if you do this a finite amount of times, um, then say if you stop after n times, then well, you get some structure here. Okay, and of course we may make this little n quite large, but we don't go all the way to the boundary, which would uh, mean that n becomes infinite. Okay, so let's stop after a finite amount of times. Okay, so then uh, we, in this way, we obtain a so-called inflation rule, which means if we go from one layer to the next, uh, the red uh, vertices get replaced by a particular more complicated word, which is um, this one. And the blue ones, the V ones, they also get replaced uh, by another word, which is also more long. So, and if you do that n times, you get a, a quite wild uh, sequence of A's and B's, okay? And in fact, if you do this many times, um, then in fact, at the end, uh, you get a long so-called aperiodic sequence. And um, so this uh, the size, uh, size grows by a particular factor at each step. 
Sorry, I just realized I had my wrong glasses, so that's why everything looks very blurred. Okay, sorry. Let me just take my other glasses. Okay, so, so this leads to the so-called aperiodic sequences of A's and B's. Now, um, the idea is, of course, now we have to do um, some assumptions because otherwise we don't know where to start. And um, so our central assumption was now that um, we use these A's and B's to define the couplings of a particular spin chain at the boundary. So at the boundary, of course, we have this one dimensional system here and it's discrete. So the most natural thing that you can assume that you have is just to have a, a spin chain. Okay, so as I said, my motivation was that in the end, uh, we want to come up with a duality which is similar to the standard ads -CFT duality. Okay, so this first line um, is the standard ads -CFT duality that everybody knows uh, in the case of uh, ads 2 plus 1. So on one hand side, you have in the continuum case, uh, the conjecture is that you have quantum gravity in ads 2 plus 1. And uh, you map it to the one plus one dimensional CFT at its boundary. And these are dual in the sense, particular that uh, if you just consider empty space, then that will be dual to the CFT vacuum state. Now, the program that we want to pursue, but okay, we didn't quite reach the end, but we made some progress that I'm uh, about to show to you, uh, is now that we fix a constant time slice and uh, regularly uh, discretize the, the Poincare uh, disk via these tilings. Um, and then we get some particular uh, quantum chain at the boundary. And then of course the conjecture will be that we also get some kind of um, gravity theory um, on the discrete geometry of this tiling, okay? And um, then also the assumption is that if we know the ground state of the, qu the quantum spin chain, it should be dual to the empty tiling, um, so without any matter fields on the, on the gravity side. Okay, so I can tell you right away that this arrow and this left hand side, we don't yet know what it's going to be, but um, we have some ideas, but okay, we, we are not yet there. But um, what I'm going to tell you for the remainder of the technical part of the talk is um, the structure of this theory here. Okay, and um, so we, in, by making some particular assumptions, which are mostly motivated considering the most simple uh, possible case which still turns out to be quite complicated. <laughs> um, we write a Hamiltonian that reflects precisely this aperiodic sequence that I was mentioning here. So the bulk is encoded in the boundary by an aperiodic sequence, which we then take in, to be an aperiodic sequence of the couplings at the boundary. Okay. All right, so now let's uh, consider this theory. And so I, I show you our construction principles and then we actually uh, we were actually so able to solve this theory and find the ground state. And that also has some nice properties that I'm also going to explain. Okay, so imagine you do this inflation rule n times, little n times and n becomes very large. Then at the boundary, you get uh, something like this. And uh, so there's a sequence of these A's and B's. Okay, that you see here. And um, okay, so we, we don't worry about this kind of discrete curvature that we have here. We just uh, take the sequence of A's and B's and, um, and turn this into a sequence uh, of couplings. Okay, so we get a spin chain. So every vertex corresponds to a spin now. And uh, then we have a sequence of red and blue couplings, uh, which mimic precisely this aperiodic sequence that we get from the geometry in the bulk. And um, so we just, I mean, of course, this is an assumption, okay, that it's an assumption that the, the, the sequence we get from the bulk kinematics in this discrete setting is reflected by the couplings in the boundary spin chain. Okay, that's an assumption. And it's just motivated that this is the simplest thing you can do to start somewhere, okay. Um, then uh, we make two further assumptions uh, that every vertex in, in this line corresponds to a bond in the, in the model. And um, then of course we need some dynamic degrees of freedom. And um, so every edge then we associate with just a spin a half degree of freedom. Okay. That's particularly motivated by the fact that we want to do something as simple as possible, because um, as we all know, in principle, if you do uh, holographic dualities, you have to be in some kind of large n limit. And, um, and on the other hand, 
uh, as I will also show to you, this um, system is still in the weakly coupled regime. Okay, so also for that reason, you don't really expect to have a duality in the sense of the standard ADS CFT duality. But nevertheless, as a starting point, I'm going to show you that the spin chain has some interesting properties. And then now we, as a next step, we can take it from there. So we can consider some spin n uh, models rather than spin a half, say, and and another step would be to include some strong coupling motion there in some way. Okay, but that's uh, something to do for the future. I'll talk about the not end a little bit uh, later on, but okay, just for simplicity, let's stick with this uh, spin a half case for now. Okay, um, one, so this has some, these aperiodic spin chains, they have been studied by uh, various people in, con in uh, statistical mechanics already some years ago. And um, now, so the nice thing about this model is in principle, you start with something which is in a gapless regime. So there's uh, some notion of criticality and conformal invariance and so on. And then now the step is to introduce these aperiodic modulations, which in our case are now motivated by our discretized bulk. And then there's different types of modulations that you can introduce. So they, there can be uh, relevant modulations. Uh, which drive your, so if you do an RG analysis now, drive your system to a new fixed point, which is induced by this aperiodicity. Then, um, then there's a marginal um, modulation, which means that the critical de properties um, depend exactly on what the values of J, A, and G, J, B are. And then there are some irrelevant modulations which means that in the modulated case, uh, the system has the same critical properties as uh, the homogeneous model. Okay. And so we start with this XXZ chain uh, for which you can see the Hamiltonian here. So there's a coupling parameter here. And so these couplings, they can in principle uh, not be A or B. Yeah? So, so reflecting the modulation, but then we also allow for this extra parameter delta zero here to make it an XXZ chain. Okay, so um, then the physical parameters are precisely this delta zero, which creates this um, different value for the for the third spin, and uh, R is the ratio of the two couplings. So and then, uh, as people found a long time ago, uh, this is an interacting model, of course, and it's gapless when this delta is between zero and one. Okay, so now um, this is our Hamiltonian. And now uh, let's find the ground state. And to do that, we have to apply some renormalization group techniques. Um, so there's actually a particular version of the renormalization group, which is particularly fitting for our problem, which is the so-called strong disorder renormalization group. And we will use this. Um, uh, although I should say that the name strong disorder is slightly confusing, maybe now, I mean, it's just what this technique is called. But of course, in our case, we don't have strong disorder, we have this aperiodic sequence, okay? But this is just a technical name for a particular kind of RG, which I'm going to describe to you now. Um, so it was developed for random disorder, but it can be applied to these aperiodic XSE chains, okay? So, and that works in some particular regime. So, as I mean, so in our sequence, we have a few of these red um, couplings and, and many of the blue ones. So how does RG procedure works is that uh, you take, um, in your sequence, you take two red couplings that uh, appear somewhere with a certain number of blue ones between them. Yeah, I just show one and two, but there could be many more. And um, so there's also a difference whether you have an um, odd or an even number because, um, uh, okay, so you have to, some technicalities change if you change the number. And um, so then um, if um, the, the couplings here in the middle are much bigger than the ones here, the boundaries, and um, if this delta zero that you have is much bigger than uh, this uh, isotropy parameter, Oops, I can't see. Uh, here, I mean, via the RG techniques, there will be actually this splits into two, a left and a right one. Okay. Um, then, um, then you can perform a particular RG step, which is replacing uh, this sequence by just an effective coupling. 
Okay, so you always replace all the blue ones between two red ones by a new effective coupling. Okay, and that you can do many times. And then there are many questions about how many of these steps actually do you recover the original sequence? So there can be certain periodicities in, in the RG and uh, so which plays an important role in this analysis. Okay, and then you get some particular uh, flow diagram. So here are the uh, two different um, anisotropy parameters for the A and B couplings, and R is the ratio between the two couplings. And uh, so then there's a number of possibilities of what you actually get, but for the rest of the talk, I'm going to concentrate on this particular fixed point. So um, this SDRG techniques is if you start somewhere on this red line, in particular for the XXX model, it drives you to this fixed point where the anisotropy parameters go to zero, which means that you stick, you stick in an XXX model. So um, the third poly matrix is treated the same way as the other two. And so for the remainder of the talk, I think I will sit in, in this fixed point here. Okay, but you can, uh, these RG steps, they give you this particular flow of your periodic spin chain. Okay, and um, so now um, to make some steps towards uh, more known concepts in homography, we actually calculated the entanglement entropy in this aperiodic chain. And uh, okay, so again, you, you take a particular uh, entanglement region and um, then, um, so uh, this thing, I think this calculation was mostly done by, by Giuseppe in, in our group. Um, you can um, just look at the, calculate just um, in the standard way, um, your entanglement entropy from the density matrix that you get for the spin chain, okay? So, uh, and then if you do that, um, so L is the number of sizes uh, that you have in your aperiodic range, and this is the entanglement entropy that you get. And um, then uh, you see this piecewise linear behavior. So the piecewise linear behavior comes from uh, this periodicity that you may have in, in, in your RG flow. But the important point is that you get an envelope which looks like this, and this is a logarithmic envelope, okay, which is kind of reassuring because that's what you would expect to happen that your entanglement entropy has this logarithmic behavior. Okay, and then uh, you can uh, calculate the coefficient of this logarithmic behavior. And uh, so that you can call an effective central charge, uh, which depends on P and Q. Of course, it's not a central charge because, of course, we have uh, broken conformal symmetry. So this is there's no real or algebra. So uh, I mean, this is just a name for the coefficient that appears in this uh, entanglement entropy. Uh, but you can calculate it analytically, and of course, it will depend on p and q. So the number of uh, edges, uh, the number of corners in your polygon, and the number of how many polygons meet at each corner. And um, so uh, if you take P to be equal to six, for instance, then you get this result here. So you get an interesting analytical function um, that that's the coefficient here of, of this log envelope. Okay. Um, I think this goes to zero if Q becomes very large. Um, so, um, of course, you know, it's not immediately obvious how to compare this to any continuum result or to um, anything you know about the Ryu Takayanagi formula in the bulk. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, this has interesting features. So, um, and another important thing is that we can really study the ground state of our model. And uh, we can actually also find a tensor network representation of the ground state by implementing these RG steps uh, in an tensor network approach. Okay, so that's the other thing that we did. Um, so we looked in, into this uh, tensor network approach that by now is quite familiar in, in, in ADS-CFT context, and which provides a natural construction for the holographic dimension, um, although of course there's no dynamical gravity involved here anywhere. Okay. And now we found, a, so this is mostly done by uh, Zhou Yuzhen in our group, so we use a tensor network to implement this particular RG transformations that I showed you for this aperiodic chain. And uh, so this is the standard technique of um, um, tensor networks that is used in, in these uh, works which I mentioned here. And um, so um, 
basically you 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 write your um, tensors in this expansion where n is the um, number of spins to be renormalized. And essentially, so looking at this plot here at the bottom right, um, you see that this picture uh, now becomes this. Okay, so on every side you have a single tensor which goes to the next level, but then here in the middle there's a two tensor which kind of terminates um, the links which come from these middle ones that get integrated out. Okay, so so there's a direct map between this RG transformation that we found and and this building block of of the of the tensor network. Okay, so now the, again there will be a different one for. Um, uh, even an odd numbers of uh, vertices on the boundary. But then uh, what you can actually do is to, to build your tensor network um, out of, of these building blocks. And um, essentially what you get is that the tensor network is given by these green lines. Okay, so this is for different numbers of P's and Q's. Um, so, and the key result of this analysis is what is written in blue down here. Okay, so that's uh, so the new thing uh, compared to other analysis using tensor networks is that we have a true representation of the ground state of a particular Hamiltonian that we have developed according to the procedures that I explained before. Okay, so and let me just read the sentence because it's important. So replacing the decimated blocks with tensor states throughout the whole SDRG flow. In contracting the shared legs of the tensors, we obtain the tensor network, which reproduces exactly the ground state of um, a periodic XXX change. Okay, so we really have a true, we found the true ground state of our model and um, uh, which we can depict in this tensor network uh, picture. So, of course, um, I mean, there's other tensor network constructions, for instance, by Isaac and collaborators. Uh, where they don't know exactly what the degrees of freedom at the boundary are, but they manage to actually get a tensor network which exactly follows the lattice that we started with. Okay, that we don't get. I mean, our green lines they don't connect to these vertices. But however, this discrete symmetry, uh, which is in the problem here, you see, of course, this hexagon has a Z6 symmetry yeah, because you see these pizza slices here. Or here, there's a Z4 symmetry, and that's of course the symmetry is reflected. All the, all the green lines don't go exactly through these blue and red dots anymore. Okay, but nevertheless, uh, we have a true ground state for our Hamiltonian, and that's the central result of this analysis uh, that I showed you. And um, then we can again um, calculate the effective central charge, which is the coefficient of the entanglement entropy that we get from this ground state. And um, so um, there's, um, as always for tensor networks, there's an upper bound, but uh, if we have the so-called perfect um, tensors, uh, which in our case happens when P is equal to six, and then this bound is exactly saturated and it agrees with the um, brute force calculation of the density matrix that I showed before. So that's also very nice. Now, um, we were very bold and wanted to compare something you know, to compare something in the bulk, and it, um, I can tell you right away that in this case we get a slightly different result, and because there's no reason to expect so we, that it will coincide with our recoupling model that we had before. But uh, just for comparison, um, so this is some work which my um, master student Jonathan Pearl did. So we adapted the Rio Takanagi formula just phenomenologically to this uh, discretized space. Um, so, and then we have this PQ tidings. And uh, according to Rio Takanagi, we have to follow the geodesic. And now, of course, if originally you are geodesic from one side to the other, it's along this blue line, then now, of course, you have to follow the edges of your polygons. And you get the slightly longer path that you see here. Okay. Um, and then, um, so Jonathan just calculated the length of these new uh, geodesics, and that gives uh, another value for this effective central charge here, which multiplies the L and L behavior. And um, this coefficient again depends on the discretization, so it depends on p on p and q. But of course, the bio coefficients will be different 
from the ones that we calculated from this boundary Hamiltonian. And there's absolutely no reason why they should agree because the other one is recoupling and so on. So uh, it's just reassuring that in both cases, we get this log L behavior. Uh, we get a, we can identify a coefficient that de depends on P and Q, but um, it's not the same coefficient, okay. But okay, it's not such a big surprise that it's not. I mean, it would have been a very big surprise if it were. Um, okay. Okay, so so that's uh, as far as we got in this paper, which we wrote uh, last May. So um, uh, essentially, what the text here describes precisely this graph. So uh, we start with some hyperbolic tiling, and then we have these inflation rules, which are defined by this tiling, and from that we obtain some aperiodic sequence. So this aperiodic sequence we we take to construct a particular or to choose a particular Hamiltonian. Uh, although I, I mean, I, of course, I showed to you that there were a lot of choices like, you know, spin a half um, and, and things like that, um, that are a bit ad hoc, but just are the simplest case that you can do uh, to get a model with criticality and so on, and which you can solve. And then, okay, so then we obtained this particular aperiodic uh, XXZ model, and then we applied this strong disorder RG techniques. Okay, so where strong disorder is just a name, and we don't have strong disorder, we have these aperiodic sequences. And that gives us a particular tensor network, which reproduces the bulk. And um, so it has the same symmetries <clears throat> as we had before, but it doesn't exactly reproduce this hyperbolic tiling. So that's why there's a dashed line here. And uh, of course, um, also there's no dynamics yet on the gravity side. So that's also something we would like to include in the future. Okay, so that's what we had. And now, um, how much time do I have? Another five minutes or so? Okay. Yeah, but, you have um, at least five, five minutes, probably 10. Okay, very good. Uh, okay, I, I can certainly go on for a little more. <laughs> okay, I don't, I don't want to go over time too much, but um, so uh, let me mention a few other things that we did after this first paper. Um, so one idea was to uh, calculate correlation functions uh, from this bulk geodesic, which I showed to you. And we use this fact that if the scaling dimension of oper the operators considered is very large, then actually uh, the two point function is given by this expression here. Uh, so where this is the geodesic. Okay, so in the large uh, scaling dimension, but I think this is already done by Balasan, Balasan Romanian and collaborators already in 1999, uh, then your two point function is essentially given by, by the length of the geodesics and the scaling dimension. So we use that and inserted this length of the uh, correlation function. And um, because of this logarithm appearing, uh, we indeed get this uh, power law behavior. Uh, However, what we find is that the scaling dimension, which we get here is the, the one of the operator that we put in, but then we get a factor which depends on all uh, this discretization of our, our model. And uh, so what we generally find is that this extra factor is larger than one. And uh, this means that the scale dimension is enhanced and that's kind of obvious if you look at this picture again. Um, because um, if you want to have fluctuations, um, fluctuations can only take place along these edges of the polygons, and then um, they, they have to be much larger to take place, okay, so they need more energy, and that means that the fields are more localized, um, because fluctuations become less, less likely, and, and that um, immediately motivates or explains why, why this is no bigger than uh, it was before. Um, so that's kind of nice to note. Uh, another important thing I would like to mention is the symmetries of the problem. Um, of course, we all uh, love ADS-CFT because there are so many symmetries in ADS and CFT and they match and so on. So of course, one important thing for this whole construction here would also be to look at fields that transform in particular representations of the residual symmetry. Now, the remnant of the conformal symmetry that we have uh, subject to this discretization is the so-called Fuchsian symmetry. And uh, so this Fuchsian group is a discrete subgroup of PSL2R, so of the conformal group in this case. Okay. Now, if we only do finitely many inflation steps and don't go all the way to the boundary, then in fact, we still have yet another group, which is the so-called triangle group, which is a 
a, sub a particular case of this Fuxin group, if you want, except for the fact that um, it's not Fuxin in the sense that because it also contains uh, reflections. Okay, but without this reflection, it's, 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 it is actually a Fuxin group. Okay, then so you have this isometry group of hyperbolic triangulations, uh, which you can see here. So P and Q are the numbers that we had before. Uh, and um, so, so you can write down what this discrete group is. Okay, and okay, so so for for that case, um, um, you know, there are not so there is only a finite amount of representations, and in this case, you can study them easily. And what is unfortunately not so well known is the non-abelian representations of this Fuxian group, because it's a discrete but infinite group, and um, so there's not a lot of Maths literature that you know we in principle we would like something similar to the conformal group or even better something like SU4 SU4 that you have in the standard ADS CFT correspondence and then you can look at the half PPS operators and things like this and you can establish a holographic dictionary. Uh, but uh, at least so far we didn't find enough information about the representations of the group that allows us to construct such representations. So that's another thing to do to do for the future, and I think there's some very beautiful mathematics uh, waiting there. Okay, uh, something we did, however, was to uh, look at the large n uh, case. So rather than having spin a half degrees of freedom, we have now an S O n spin chain. And um, so um, why is it S O N and S not S U N? Because for S U N in the large N limit, the model is no longer critical. But I mean, to get any chance to have something like conformal symmetry, you want a critical model. So that's why we consider it S O N. And to please, uh, put, um, make a long story short, uh, essentially it just means that wherever, because we are still in the recoupling limit, Wherever we had ln twos appearing in the um, entanglement entropy, they will be replaced by ln n. Okay, but the, the the dependence on p and q stays exactly the same as before. So uh, that's nice because it's expected. Um, but again, it reflects the fact that to actually get something which is strongly coupled, we have to put in some extra information, which we haven't done yet. Okay. So that's something which we did in this more recent paper. Uh, if you're interested, and another thing we did there was to calculate the, the mutual information, uh, again, just by looking at the density matrix for our model. And um, it, so in, if, I don't know if you're, if you're familiar with mutual information, uh, just to mention this quickly, in the continuum case, there's a phase transition. Um, if you separate, so then it means you have two entangling regions, and if you separate them beyond a critical value in the continuum case, then the mutual information is zero. But here, that doesn't seem to happen. And even if you wait for a very long time, suddenly you get a little wiggle there again. Um, so, so there's not such a clear cut phase transition between mutual information being finite or um, zero. OK, but in the last five minutes, um, I would like to just go through all these uh, very interesting connections to neighboring research areas, uh, which you can see here. Um, so let's start with the mathematical physics. So first of all, um, I should say there's a big field in mathematics which is very well studied. So it's already in Wikipedia. So if you look at the left hand side here um, of, of this graph, and um, there's actually the question if you have any set of points, not necessarily a manifold, okay, and um, which, however, is hyperbolic in a particular mathematical sense. Then the question is, you know, if you go to the boundary, which of course, uh, you know, your space is non-compact, and, and so you, there's some kind of infinity limit, but still, then you get a, a boundary um, set of points. And then you can ask, uh, can you calculate this boundary set of points given the structure of your points in the bulk? And that's a very active area in mathematics, and there are many, many interesting results. So, I mean, this Mathematica, uh, this uh, Wikipedia page is actually extremely well written, so you can take a look. Um, so, the, the, the it's called finding the Gorm of boundary. So, the Gorm of boundary is the set of all points at infinity. Now, our much loved example of the ADS CFT correspondence fits in there because it's known that if your hyperbolic space is a manifold and you have an ADS space, then, um, so if it's ADS2, then it's known actually that um, 
the boundary is just as a circle in this one. Or oh, in higher dimensions, I mean, we all know that the boundary is this compactified flat space. And this can be proved mathematically by using um, these uh, Gromov boundary techniques. But uh, what is actually interesting is that um, if you start with any of these lattices, discrete lattices in ADS2, then actually it has been proven that the boundary is still an S1. Okay, so still a, a manifold there. Um, so so the, the, the correct term is that here you have something which is homeomorphic to your sphere, I think. Um, so that's very interesting that on the boundary you still get a continuous manifold, even if you have this discrete uh, tiling in the bulk. However, there are more involved examples, and this brings me to this paper by Matilda Marconi and her collaborators. Um, so they have a very beautiful paper from last year um, where they look at particular tensor networks and um, they they consider or they even prove the validity of the Ryu Takanagi formula in, in some generalized hyperbolic spaces. Okay, if you take more branching ratios at each point, uh, I mean, not just special vertex in flat space, but more branching ratios, then um, the boundary will actually be a fractal. Uh, here, there's this, and, and I think they have the, the um, what is the dimension pole in fractals? Uh, host of dimension, okay, sorry, the host of dimension is the one of a so called Sierpinski triangle, I think. Um, so, um, so then uh, they they have these very beautiful results. Uh, if they have these factorial geometries, uh, that they can still prove that um, and a generalization version of the Ryu Takanagi formula is still true. Okay, so um, essentially they scale with uh, length scale to the d minus one, where d is the host of dimension. And th th that brings them to the question: uh, So what exactly is a CFT on a fractal and uh, uh, that's a certainly open question due to the reason that the representations of uh, these Fuxian groups are not so well known. And uh, um, okay, so that's certainly also something interesting to study. And uh, I don't think very much is known about this. Um, then let me just briefly mention uh, this very nice work in condensed matter physics um, where. Um, a number of people, uh, for instance, all of these. Um, so, how can collaborators, the uh, color, how collaborators, uh, Macheco, Rayan, uh, Bertia, and Tomale collaborators? Um, so, this is a group at um, Ann Arbor. Um, so, they um, they consider these tight bonding Hamiltonians with nearest neighbor hopping on the hyperbolic lattice. And uh, so, they ask slightly different questions because, of course, they are not so much interested in the boundaries that they, they impose. Um, um, periodic boundary conditions, and uh, they want to stand, study the band theory in, in, for these models. So they have to find a block theorem, which means there is a Fourier transform in hyperbolic space that needs to be implemented. But they also studied representations of the Fuchsian group to some extent, and and they, they as, as I said, they, they proved a generalization of block theorem. So that can be quite mathematical as well. Um, but um, and what is very interesting that they also actually uh, managed to to actually build um, ADS2 spaces. Okay, and so there's different uh, examples for hyperbolic lattices which are made from these coplanar waveguide resonators. So this is the one which is in this uh, paper by Colin Fitzpatrick and Howe. And and so this is a ADS2 with um, resonators that um, was built by I think that's what described in this paper. Um, by um, Tom Hanne and um, Böttcher also, and uh, their collaborators also at um, um, Zurich, I think with Titus Neupert or so on. And um, so they, um, so I can basically say my colleague has an ADS2 space in his office. It's a Euclidean one, though, okay. Okay, so, so, but in this context, the study is a little different um, because um, they, they study the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of the Laplacian um, in, in this case. And um, um, that's a little bit different from this analysis of the um, wave equation of motion that I showed to you at the beginning, because the boundary conditions are chosen in a slightly different way. But of course, there, there are many relations. And it would be super nice if we can take these gravity results that we have and make some predictions for, for what's happening here. So that's also, I can, I'm watching Matthias all the time because he's sitting in my little window at the top right corner. So there's something we, we talk also with, about with Matthias right now. 
and how far we can make a connection to any CFT to these um, uh, connect data approaches. Oops, sorry. All right. Uh, to conclude, uh, let me say that um, uh, also in lattice gauge theory, uh, there's uh, this is two uh, uh, papers which I would like to mention in this context: one by Grower and collaborators, one by Cutterell and collaborators, um, and they still study um, scalar fields and hyperbolic lattices and using lattice gauge theory. And, and they also calculate correlation functions and find agreement with the bike results. Um, and um, I think the fact that, um, so um, coming back to my Brighton Luna Friedman bond analysis at the beginning, I saw it, told you that um, the numerical calculation shows that there's this universal curve uh, according to which the, the continuum Brighton Luna Friedman bond is approached if, when the cutoff is taken to infinity. And, and also the fact that uh, the, the correlation functions found in these papers um, agree so much um, with, with the CFT expectations. Um, this must be connected to, to this result, which I mentioned before, um, that um, if you do anything with such a discrete lattice here, then this, the, the boundary is still a sphere. And uh, I think that, so, which means on the boundary, you recover conformal symmetry. And, and that seems to be the cause, although it would be nice to make this more precise way. Uh, there's such a good match with the CFT expectations. All right, and then of course, the next step would be to do something on the bike side of this correspondence. And uh, that means, um, of course, we have to have a kind of discrete notion of gravity and, uh, there, of course, there are several proposals that you can think of. Um, I mean, you know, there, many people have studied discrete versions of, of gravity. There's, um, you know, this causal dynamical triangulations, for instance, or there's some other papers that I mentioned here from people at Perimeter. And, and there's something called the edge length dynamics, um, where um, it's a little simpler, it's just the, essentially the length of our polygons that would start fluctuating rather than the entire position and so on. Of, of the whole lattice. And um, okay, so um, there are many possibilities that one could envisage, and that's at least so many interesting things that could be done in the future uh, in this direction. And in particular, maybe this is an idea of having uh, ADS CFT beyond one over n, because there's certainly a semi classical way of introducing quantum corrections. Okay, so that brings me to the end and let me just conclude. So um, I showed you some aspects of discrete homography, which um, hope if it all works out as I would like to, <laughs> will provide a new example of a holographic duality, which is of relevance in quantum gravity, condensed matter physics, and also mathematical physics. And uh, okay, so the, the central result that we have as a first step is the one in red here. So we found a boundary spin chain Hamiltonian uh, reflecting the tiling structure of the bulk, which is provided by this inflation rule. Okay, and so that's the central result that we have so far, which was obtained a particular RG and tensor network study. And we calculated the entanglement entropy just from the density matrix and compared with the modified Takayanagi formula in the bulk. So there's no agreement because the one um, set of uh, Question is certainly in the weekly, weekly coupled limit. Okay, so so uh, as an outlook for the future, I mean, um, I, large n, we partially already did a few things by looking at this SON model, but then important questions are to include beyond uh, nearest neighbor or beyond nearest neighbor interactions in the spin chain, and maybe also introduce some notion of averaging, which uh, brings us to kind of matrix model ideas, which certainly can be adopted here. And then certainly for, if we want a duality, we have to say something about the quantum gravity side and um, adapt uh, versions of discrete approaches. Okay, so that brings me to the end and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Johanna. Well, a very nice um, overview of this, your recent work on discrete holography. Um, are there questions? I can, while others might still think, um, I can start out with um, one question that is, uh, I mean, I also start with the first question that came up uh, in uh, on slide 11, you okay. had, um, yeah, I think it would, it would be useful for you to keep sharing. 
Yeah, um, okay. Although then you can cannot see the people I know the conundrum. Um, <laughs> so the, you talked about the aperiodicity um, and how uh, in the different cases, yeah, for the relevant uh, case, for example, the um, fixed point is is uh, like uh, this this through the aperiodicity, there's a new fixed point that the system flows to. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, you, you did distinguish between um, aperiodic um, boundaries with even and odd numbers of, mm -hmm. of sites, but mm -hmm. also just in the sequences. I mean, there's different, different sequences you could think of that are aperiodic. So instead of ABBA, you can have BAAB or something like that, right? So is there, is there a dependence of that fixed point on the specific aperiodicity? That's what I'm trying to to understand. So you you yeah, said okay. that the, yeah, okay, the location okay. of the fixed point in the in parameter space or coupling um, space. Yeah, I mean, I think for all of the P's and Q's, um, there's this XXX fixed point for, for sure. But so what will be the difference is a different type of RG transformations here. Okay, so um, we use this inflation rule a very large number of times. Yeah, so so little n steps and n we take, but we take n to be very large. And um, so then, of course, um, you know, because there's le less of the red and more of these blue vertices, of course, um, not at every step, um, you know, there will be the same amount of blue between all the red. Okay, so that has to be taken into account. But you can actually prove and, and using all these techniques. Okay, maybe I shouldn't go into too many details here, but, but uh, using these techniques, which are already known for the aperiodic axis Z chains. Um, that um, there, there, there's a certain, I mean, you can, if you do a particular number of RG steps, you, you recover the same sequence that you started with. So there's a kind of periodicity in your RG uh, structure of the couplings, which of course only appears if you make N very big. And um, so, and um, um, the simplest case is if you take a so-called singlet, okay, which means that at every level of at every RG step, you recover the same aperiodic sequence that you started with. And um, there's cases where this happens. And it, of course, it depends on the number of P and Q that you have. Okay. And um, so that's the thing is the simplest case is the singlet um, RG behavior. And uh, then you can also consider the case that after two steps, you recover the same aperiodic sequence than you started with. And um, Okay, I have to say I'm not the absolute 100% expert on this because this is mostly done by Joseph and uh, Ryu. Um, but um, so uh, if if you look at these papers and if you look at our paper from May, there's a very long discussion of how exactly this procedure works. And um, um, yeah, but I mean, fortunately, these methods they were already developed um, before uh, us, and we could just apply them to our particular geometry in a nice way. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, maybe for, for that, I see that Sergio has a question, but just to, since you show this figure, I can maybe sp more specifically ask my question here. So does this little arrow there mean that uh, once you have a periodicity, your fixed point moves? Is that is that what the little arrow indicates? Yeah, exactly. So so um, if you if you start on so if you start on your model on this red line and mm -hmm. you perform this. Um, steps which are depicted up here, uh, you, you end up at a fixed point where the um, where this anisotropy, sorry, this thing uh, goes away. So in the sense that uh, you just essentially have an XXX model. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. I, I should let uh, Sergio ask um, his question. Go ahead. Oh, okay, thanks. So thanks Hi. for the talk. Uh, was wondering if you can study complexity in, in this type of duality. If you, I don't know, if you have some sense about that with the, in any of the points. Uh, yeah, on the field theory side of, okay. I mean, we haven't got a gravity side yet. So <laughs> anything mm -hmm. we can do is on the field theory side. But um, yes, I mean, of course, it's a very valid question. Um, of course, it, yeah, I, I, it should be possible to, to um, Define complexity more simply than in any. I mean, okay. So the problem of having complexity in ADS-CFT is always that you have to know how to define 
complexity for field theories, uh, quantum field theories. Yeah? And so, as, as you know, there are many approaches where people use uh, symmetry transformations and so on. But here, since we have this discrete model, I think it is, is much more straightforward that you can study uh, just, um, you, you can define some operation on your spins that is allowed. Okay, so you have a much more down to earth definition to complexity than, than if you look at a CFT. I mean, you, for instance, you can say half spin up and spin down. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have some predefined uh, unitary transformation of flipping a certain number of these spins. And, and then, of course, um, you can calculate this co the complexity um, of in, in, you know, for a given reference state using this. Um, uh -huh. So, OK, so you are mentioning mostly on the on this, let's say, on your spin chain side, right? Or Yeah, yeah. So at the moment, I'm just talking about the spin chains. OK, so, so and I think in, since you have a spin chain, it's much easier to calculate complexity than in a CFT. The problem is, if you want to compare to anything on the gravity side, then um, it becomes harder because I mean, you know, we, we haven't. I mean, okay, maybe if you take something which is kinematic, if you say I want to compare to to some particular volume, I mean, maybe it's actually a good idea to do that. Yeah, you know, if if you can say okay, the complexity I get the boundary from these spins corresponds to some particular volume in in this discrete lattice, uh, that would be super interesting. I mean, um, now that I think of it, you know, thanks, thanks for the suggestion. But of course, um, we don't have any dynamical theory yet on the gravity side. So then, you know, if you want something dynamical, I, I would I mean, this would be a first step to do. But you're absolutely right. I mean, maybe um, we can compare. Um, I mean, the complexity on the on the boundary is straightforwardly defined, and then we can maybe this complexity volume can be easily tested then yeah or the the one that you proposed recently right that you also have like a well-defined map between the cft and the bulk type of site for the complexity with this yeah exactly uh, so, yeah yeah that's I, ex yeah thanks for suggesting <laughs> no that no, no, i think uh, i think that that's the most network yeah, that you can yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay yeah, no, it's not such a, it's, it's a super good idea. I think um, then, yeah, okay, so I, I see what you mean. Then we can use some symmetry transformations in the back. Yeah, oh, okay. thanks for this. I didn't yeah, yeah. We can talk about it afterwards if, if you want. Anyways. Yeah, yeah, that sounds excellent. Yeah, thanks a lot. Also with Mitchell, but okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question um, and the idea behind the question. So any um, any more questions? Everybody's totally overwhelmed. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I have two small questions, but I um, I have one big question. So I, since we're in, in Holotube, I, I feel compelled to ask about your motivational slide. Um, yeah. So I like the idea very much. And you mentioned that um, you discussed this also with Martin Amon uh, before, like the most, uh, motivational slide of, of uh, creating dual dual descriptions of physical systems which do not originate from ADS-CFT in the Maldosena sense. Um, and obviously there are some examples, I, I would say for dual descriptions of, of, simil of, of one physical systems already in physics that exists. But um, I, I would just be interested in um, if you want this somehow to be guided by, by renormalization group or tensor networks and so on. Um, I thought that the, the underlying idea was the, like kind of a, um, uh, kind of a ma matching of degrees of freedom or limitation of degrees of freedom in a quantum field theory that leads to, to it being described by a gra classical gravitational theory. That was, I think, the, the idea of yeah, the yeah, yeah. holographic principle in the sense of Toft mm -hmm. and then Susskind. Um, so I, I'm wondering if you, if are you saying, like I'm, I'm trying to get a guide from you. Is, is, is this the, still the direction or should we give up on that idea and just say there is some sort of, um, kind of degree of freedom uh, reduction in the quantum field theory that makes it possible to describe it by by like classical means. It, I'm trying to understand what which direction oh, you're okay. trying to push I mean, this in. Thanks for the, thanks for the question, Matthias. I mean, I I would still like it to be as close to the original ADS CFT correspondence as possible, in the sense that I really like to see a holographic principle. So in the sense that there should be same amount uh, or the scaling of the degrees of freedom in the bulk uh, uh, should be with the you know with the boundary um, volume i mean just as in standard ads cft 
And I also uh, would expect on the graph in, in the bulk, we said get some discrete version of gravity in some sense. Okay, so that I would also expect. And um, and then um, you know I would expect the holographic principle to hold. I mean, in ADS-CFT, why does it work so well? The holographic principle and the symmetries match. Okay, so but of course here this requires some work to establish this. I mean, I, I mentioned a little bit the problems with the symmetries that the representation of these groups are not so well studied. And um, then, of course, um, to, to, to actually show, that, I mean, that would be another interesting project to show that the holographic principle works in this case, which I would hope it does. And because there's still this idea of hyperbolicity, of course, in the problem. But OK, I don't think, I mean, maybe it's a way of actually proving that the holographic principle holds yeah, in some sense. Um, but then exactly what the gravity theory looks like, I mean, as I said, I mean, you know, probably these edge links dynamics are the simplest thing to do where you can have some dynamical degrees of freedom on the bulk side. But of course, we haven't studied that yet. But um, okay, my philosophy would be I would try to be as close to the original ADS safety correspondence as possible mm -hmm. in the discrete setting. I mean, one thing that might be thing would be to look at matrix models and in the sense um, of their relation with JT gravity and so on. If, I mean, that would probably also be something fruitful to look at. Mm -hmm. just, the lattice is realized there. But uh, so, yeah, my answer to your question, Matthias, is I, you know, I, I just wanted to have, in principle, I want to have the original correspondence, but then this good ties. But that, of course, has some radical implications. <laughs> and, and not of them, I mean, most of them are not understood yet, but I think it's an interesting question. Okay, yeah, thank you. Are there any other questions before we close the session? If that does not seem to be the case. So um, thank you, Johanna, again. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks and again, thanks uh, everybody. Yeah, thanks, Matthias, for organizing this. And I hope to see you soon, everybody, <laughs> in a particular Matthias. Of, of, of course, we'll stick around for a minute after the recording ends, so, which I will make happen just now. So thank you and goodbye and see you next week. <laughs>